Good evening, everyone, wherever this happens to find you, and welcome to Company of Rogues Actors Studios live Q&A with Joe Norman Shaw. This is the first time we've done something like this, so uh, we're super excited to, to try it out and excited to hear your feedback afterwards. It is going to be a fun evening for everybody. So uh, I want to tell you a few things about what you're gonna what to expect tonight first before we get started. So uh, we are going to talk with Joe Norman Shaw, the uh, co founder of Company of Rogues. And uh, we're going to talk to him about some stories from past shows and films that he's worked on. We're going to talk about uh, the craft of acting. You submitted questions to us, which were amazing. Thank you for doing that. And uh, we are going to, and Joe is going to answer some of your questions live on the air here. Um, uh, if you submitted a question, um, and if you uh, are watching this live on Facebook, you will have the chance uh, to win a $400 scholarship uh, to Company of Rogues to be applied to a class of your choice. So again, you have to have had submitted a question to us in advance. So not right now, but in advance. Uh, and you have to be watching this live. And then we'll, uh, you can respond on, on Facebook to make sure that you got it. Uh, and Sally will let me know and we will announce our winners on the air. Um, we are also going to be doing uh, throughout the evening uh, 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 we're going to be doing trivia questions, Joe-esque trivia questions, which I will announce. And uh, you can uh, put your answer in uh, in the comments, and uh, the first person to answer will win some Rogues swag. Uh, so you will win a wonderful Company of Rogues Actors Studio t-shirt, and they are pretty fancy schmancy and wonderful. Okay, so I think that is the basics of stuff. So let's get started with one trivia question here, and then we'll bring Joe on. So the first trivia question of this evening for some swag, what year was Company of Rogues founded? What year was Company of Rogues founded? Okay, so if the if the answers are coming in, Sally will uh, will let me know if we have uh, uh, if we have a winner for that, and uh, perhaps I will um, ask uh, gi give the, let, let let you know along the way. But uh, she's she's going to keep track of that for us. So um, make sure you uh, let us know if you think you know the answer. Okay, so uh, in a moment here, um, we'll bring out uh, Joe Norman Shaw. But uh, by way of an introduction. Uh, I could easily spend 10 minutes listing off uh, Joe's numerous credits in film, TV, theater, as well as being a director, uh, a teacher for many, many years. He has got a, a varied and storied career um, that uh, is, is full of many wonderful stories. Oh, I just find out here, uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan has won the first swag. Congratulations, Nathan. Um, so. Uh, Joe Norman Shaw. So what I wanted to do, in, in, instead of reading out his bio, which you can easily find on the website, I wanted to share with you uh, three things that I learned from Joe. Joe was uh, my teacher at uh, Mount Royal University back in uh, before the year 2000, uh, when it was still a college. And uh, I had him as an instructor in film and TV, as well as professional development, which was a course very much like our next step course that we have. Um, and uh, I wanted to share some things I learned that have stayed with me for a long time. So number one, I have three things, three. Uh, number one, uh, I remember working uh, in, in film and TV class and as a young actor, I thought all I had to do was, you know, do what I, normal acting, but just less. And I remember it not being good, it sucked. And I remember feeling like, why am I not getting this? And, and, and Joe, as well as Christiane Hurd, who, who was co-teaching the class, were constantly talking to us about being authentic and bringing, bringing yourself to this. And I remember one day uh, working on a scene from, from Big, from the film Big, if anybody remembers that. And uh, I, I remember, uh, I'm sure Joe and Christian both had said this. And I remember thinking, I'm just gonna be me for once and just let it go and have fun with it and let it rip. And sure enough, it was better. So uh, that's thing number one. Number two, Joe taught a professional development class uh, along with Christiane, and uh, I remember him distinctly saying this, and it has stuck with me for 20 plus years, and um, many of you will know that I repeat it to you too, which is the idea that work creates more work, and not letting just waiting for something to come happen, but making something happen in your life, uh, and some of what Joe's going to talk about tonight really uh, um, expresses that idea. Um, third thing, uh, I had the honor of uh, directing a rogues theater show 
over 10 years ago and um, it was The Old Neighborhood by David Mamet and Joe was in it uh, and I was directing him in the show uh, and I was a little bit nervous because I was going, oh my gosh, man, I'm, I'm directing Joe. And uh, one thing I, I, I thought about him is, aside from being a great performer, he's incredibly generous um, as an actor. And he was generous to me as a, as a young director who was still learning what he was doing. And I remember one time Joe had, had questioned me about, uh, uh, about something that we were doing in the show. And, uh, I felt good about the choice and, and he heard that and he, he accepted that and he didn't have to, he could have said, no, no, I think this is wrong, whatever, but he's an incredibly generous, warm hearted man and, um, and, and a wonderful collaborator. And um, if you ever have the pleasure uh, of acting with him, you will discover that. So uh, without any further ado, I'm pleased to bring on the co-founder of Company of Rogues Actor Studio, principal instructor, and my dear friend and colleague, Mr. Joe Norman Shaw. Come on on, Joe. Welcome. Hey, Aaron. It's funny, uh, you were talking about the old days at Mount Royal and I was thinking, well, I was actually just noticing what a great beard you have right now. And, and the gray that has come in. And I thought, I think that when you were in class then, you probably hardly needed to shave. And now <laughs> here you are, very professorial. Yeah. With, the, with the, the wisdom of the ages. So thank you for those. I mean, I'm glad you learned some great things and I appreciate the kind words that you shared, so. Well, thank you. Thank okay, you. all right. So we are going to get uh, started tonight. Um, so we are going to uh, go back to about the year, maybe 19, in sort of the late 1980s, a uh, young actor who looked uh, something like this. Um, and uh, you were, uh, take us back to what was going on for you at that time in your life. And then maybe tell us, you know, from, from this time in the late 80s and how you found Tony Trouble and ended up in the show uh, I, I, I slept with uh, uh, Tony Trouble at Confessions of a Hollywood Hustler by Bruce Bell. So where were you? What was going on? How did you end up in this one-man show that you did for a long time? Okay, yeah. I, uh, well, I should say that in the 80s, I was in Toronto. I was uh, mostly in Toronto. I, I also did Stratford and, and Shaw and uh, uh, tour to a few places, Edmonton, some hot spots, Fredericton, but Primarily, I was working as a theater actor in Toronto, and I, I had a pretty good run of it in, in the, from the early 80s through till the late 80s uh, with some, in, in some pretty awesome shows, uh, including As Is, which was the first play in Canada that was about AIDS. Really important show where we had a lot of people coming backstage who were moved by what we were doing because it told their story in a way that nobody had yet. Um, uh, but by the time uh, 1988 rolled around, um, I was fortunate at the beginning of that year to work as an understudy on a production that came out in from Williamstown Festival with uh, Joanne Woodward. Some might know Joanne was uh, Paul Newman's wife, but a very uh, highly regarded actress. And uh, oh, there's a program with people like Charles Durning and Terry Kinney. And some of these names, you, you might not recognize the name, but if you saw the, their faces, uh, Terry was Frank on the series Oz. Uh, Charles Durning was uh, Jessica Lange's father in Tootsie, who Dustin Hoffman dressed as a woman proposes to uh, proposes to Dustin Hoffman. Anyway, it was it was a great cast, and uh, I was an under they hired understudies from the Toronto acting community, and I was fortunate to be one of those understudies. And they gave us some small parts to, to play as well as understudies. But I'm I'm at the theater every night with these am amazing actors, world renowned actors. And once that finished. I kind of hit a dead spot, which I hadn't had for quite some time. And I was waitering and trying to figure out what to do next. And there wasn't any acting work coming. So uh, in the fall, I, at the, on the advice of a, a good friend of mine, I went back to class. I went to class at a place called Theater Works. I worked with Bernadette Jones, who was an awesome teacher. She is a uh, protege of Michael Shirtliff and was his mm -hmm. kind of emissary in Canada. And at her, uh, uh, acting studio, theater works. Over time, we decided, let's put on a show. Let's put on a show here in the, in, in the acting studio. So it's a small space, not that uh, different than the space we formerly had uh, here in Calgary. 
And so we put on John Patrick Shanley's Women in Manhattan. And I played Bob, mm. Bob the Big Mouth Bass, <laughs> barbecuing yep. hamburgers. That's right. And uh, during the, the run of that show, the director for this play uh, called I Slept With Tony Trouble, The Confessions of a Hollywood Hustler, David Gale, uh, who is, has, has over time had become a, a really good friend after that. And um, he, he approached me and said, I'm looking for an actor to play this part in this one man show. And I really liked what I saw in your work tonight. And would you be interested? And I said, yeah, hey, I'd love to read the script. And uh, I mean, it wasn't going to be like a real big paying gig or anything. It was going to be like an equity co-op production that uh, we were going to do at uh, the Rivoli in Toronto, like for two nights only. And I went home and I read the script and I'm kind of like, <laughs> it, was, it was really some, uh, it was quite... Uh, a bunch of salacious tales of, of that uh, the writer, Bruce Bell, who was actually a comedian at Yuck Yucks, but Bruce had collected these stories from LA hustlers. And yeah. they're like real ish stories. I mean, he may have embellished somewhat. I'm not, <laughs> but the stories were like wild. But I, I felt like there wasn't a context there for the play. So I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I, I wanted to do something, a one-man show. This is a great opportunity, but what are we going to do with this? And I was on the subway to go meet with them and discuss the project. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do this. And I, so I get this image comes to me of a play that I had seen, Fire, which is about Jimmy Swaggart and Jerry Lee Lewis. And there's a, a interview with the Jerry Lee Lewis character by a guy from the Rolling Stone. And they... And the character, Jerry Lee Lewis' character is kind of burnt out and he's kind of at the end of the road of things and really kind of like gone through it. So I start to think, wouldn't it be interesting if this character was trying to sell his stories to, uh, you know, a journalist because he, he needs mm -hmm. the money. And, and t the Tony Trouble, who is mentioned, is actually a character that the writer had created, Bruce Bell. Hopefully this isn't too roundabout. He, Bruce, he created this Rock Hudson-like character with very suave hair and dinner jackets. And so Rick, the hustler, a gay hustler, has a, an affair with him. He tries to sell this tale to a journalist. So in the uh, original incarnation, I had the director actually on stage playing the journalist with no lines. We're just, hmm. here's a bottle of Jack Daniels and a pack of smokes, tell us your story. <laughs> and I start to unwind the tales. And we did that for two nights and it was this huge success. And so we're like, well, oh, let's take it and do it at Theater Works, where we, we did the other show. So we did it there. We did like a three week, just on weekends run, and it started to gather momentum. And a friend of mine in London is like, hey, Joe, why don't you bring, why don't you bring your show over here and play it in some of the pub theaters? And so it just started to get this kind of traction. So we went to, we went to London. We played it in London. We um, played it. So I'm trying to remember the uh, I'm trying to remember the exact chronology of things because we also did it at the Toronto Fringe in August. I'm thinking there, I think this might have played over a longer period of time than I remember. Um, but eventually, we get to London. The guy who who is running the space in London loves the show. He says, "I got a space up in Edinburgh. Why don't you bring your play up to Edinburgh?" So we go to Edinburgh. We do it there. I did it at Stratford when I was there as part of their Fringe Festival. We took it to Vancouver. So from out of this show which was originally thought i don't know whether i can do this but i was out of work and like we we made enough money to kind of eat and and pay our our way but other work came from that it was a catalyst for things like unidentified human remains or getting to back to stratford it started to you start to develop a bit of a notoriety people start to see your work you get good write-ups in the paper and other doors opened up it's true. So it, it was quite uh, an adventure. <laughs> and here I have uh, a poster from, I believe, the, yeah, the Fringe of Toronto <laughs> production. Uh, there you are, chain, uh, handcuffed to uh, a drain pipe, it looks like, perhaps? Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. I think I we shot that in the old Bathurst Street theaters uh, down in the basement or something. Oh, no way. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so listen, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about this solo show because uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of, 
uh, of that style of show. And, um, and you did this show on and off for uh, over a couple of years. So, um, oh, hold on, this, I, we didn't get to see the poster. Let me try sharing that again. See if it worked here, I'll leave it up for a minute. Um, so uh, you did this show over, over a number of years. And um, what did you learn from doing a solo show? What did you learn from performing alone on stage for over a course of years? What did that teach you about acting? Um, I, I would say what, probably the biggest thing that I, like in, in retrospect now is taking your moments. Because I think there's a tendency as a young actor to like rush things. And when you're alone on stage and you got to carry the whole show, uh, you know, we had to build uh, the dynamics of, you know, where does it, the pace pick up? Where does, where does it, where does it slow down? Like, but, but owning, owning that stage and feeling myself present, this is my world and I'm inviting you into my world, but I have the, I have the, the confidence or the, the ability to, to take a moment when I need to or speed things up. Like I'm in control of the whole thing because I don't have another actor to, to work off of. And that sense of ownership that came with that. This is, this is my show. This is me in this role and kind of living the part as I'm presenting it and bringing it to life and working with the audience, you know, working because there, there was a lot of humor in it. There was a lot more touching moments, but like working with uh, the laughter of the audience. So there's a lot of craft you get from being up there on your own. And if you get lost, you got nobody to turn to. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? You got to know your stuff so well um, and be able to save it if you have to. So I, I think that I gained a lot of confidence from that. I gained, um, I certainly evolved a, a lot as an actor having to be out there for an hour every night over that time period. Um, and um, I think the ability, like I said about taking the moments, the ability to feel an audience in, in those more emotional moments and take them down with you and carry them on your back, so to speak, mm -hmm. into those deeper places and then bring them back up again and then find the humor and just having that kind of facility yeah. that you, you, you can only learn that from the doing of it. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we are going to, uh, before we segue into the next section here, we're going to go to trivia question number two. Trivia question number two, which is, what is Company of Rogues named after? What, or what was the inspiration for the name Company of Rogues? Um, so if uh, some of, this is a, a classic piece of rogues trivia, as I like to say. So uh, what is Company of Rogues named after? Throw it into the Facebook chat uh, and we'll see if you have been listening carefully. Joe often tells this story at the beginning of the year at graduations where this came from. So see if you were listening carefully. Classic rogues history and lore. The rogues <laughs> mythology. What did it evolve out of? Mm. Exactly. Exactly. We should, they should, I, I think we should institute, you know, a written test before, you know, before you graduate rogues where you have to have accumulated certain pieces of this esoteric knowledge. And it doesn't matter about the Stanislavski stuff, but where, you know, where did this name come from? We'll see. We'll see if they're listening. Um, so, so where I'd love to, to jump to now, um, you, you mentioned this uh, in, in passing, Joe, which is uh, working on a show called Unidentified Human Remains and the True Nature of Love by Brad Fraser. Um, mm -hmm. and, it, and if you don't know this play, it, it, it truly is, in my opinion, one of the classics of Canadian theater. Um, it uh, was written by uh, a young playwright from Edmonton. And this would have been, I think the original, originally he wrote it was maybe 1989. So it was around the same time, I think. The Crows Theater production you were in, I think might've been a little bit later. Is that right? Am I getting my dates we were We were in the beginning. We started rehearsals like the day after New Year's in 1990. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Because we figured out, yes, the, the playwrights production in Calgary, we figured was like 89 in February or something like that. Right? Yeah. And, and Brad had done one in Edmonton as well. Right. So yes, Unidentified Human Reigns. And you played Robert in that production. And yeah. it was with uh, a stellar cast, uh, incredible director. Um, and uh, this was, again, a show that didn't just play for a couple of weeks and it was done. You toured it 
all over and played it mm. uh, played it for a, a long time. Took it to the Edinburgh Fringe, is that right, or to, to the UK, or was it? Uh, no, no, that was that was Tony Trouble who went to the UK and, oh, okay, and the right Edinburgh right. Fringe. Uh, right, right, right. It went it went to uh, uh, the National Arts Center in Ottawa, right. and then to Montreal to the Festival des Amériques. Right. And then it went to uh, Mexico City. Right. Right. So. Um, so this production, uh, so this again is a piece of Canadian theater history. Um, mm. Did you have any sense when, how did you, how did you get cast in this play? And did you have any sense when you read it or as you were rehearsing it, that this was going to be significant? No, not really. I, I, I mean, I think it was di different for different people who were involved. I should say, um, I got involved because one of the, uh, the, the general manager producer, uh, uh, Mackenzie Gray, who, uh, and I knew J Jim Milan, the director, they, they brought me into the project. Um, I had known Mackenzie from, uh, from my Stratford days and Jim, I had auditioned for and had been cast in something I wasn't able to do. So we, d we did have some knowledge of, uh, of each other that, that brought me into the fold, but the, the, um, the center of the piece uh, I'll, I'll speak to this now to kind of, uh, kind of uh, give a presence to this story is um, the late Brent Carver. Brent Carver just passed away just a couple of days ago and Brent played David. Brent, Brent for those, I mean, it's maybe not as known well in the West as he is back in the East, although he's from Cranbrook and that's where he passed away. But Brent was a, a big star at Stratford, had done like nine seasons at Stratford. He later went on to, uh, this was after Human Remains to do Kiss of the Spider Woman on Broadway and run a Tony Award. Uh, highly uh, regarded actor of, of the highest order in Canada. Uh, he was an amazing light. Uh, I got, was fortunate I got to work on Richard III that he did up at the Citadel as well. Um, but yeah, he recently passed and uh, on Saturday, uh, all of us cast members from, from those days got together and had a Zoom gathering to to grieve and to celebrate Brent, who, who was the center of this production. But that was their feather in their cap. They got Brent Carver to play the lead in this play because Brent, who had done a, a lot of musicals and a lot of big Shakespeare shows, longed to do something intimate, something more personal for, for him. And so he, uh, Mackenzie called him up and, and they got Brent involved. Brent got excited by working with Jim, who is a very a very generous director, very uh, trusting of his actors, and uh, and they built a cast around uh, around Brent. And so um, during the rehearsals, though, we're like okay, this play was quite controversial in its time. It was uh, it's a bit on the racy side. There's nudity and you know there's a sexual subject matter, um, and so. Uh, we didn't know what we had, <laughs> no. but Brent led the way in terms of uh, us as actors and in rehearsals, we, we, we wrestled with, you know, what is this play about and humanizing these characters. We would go to the, this bar called Poppers, which is still there on, uh, on Blur Street near uh, Bathurst. Uh, we would go there after and uh, have drinks and, and wrestle with, you know, these characters and the relationships and, um, we actually all went to a, a, a cottage in Muskoka for a weekend and we rehearsed there. Hmm. You know, people were up in the, you know, Brent's up in the middle of the night going, wake Jim up, ask him what this play is about. I want to know what this play is about. <laughs> and uh, it, was a, it was a really incredible, passionate experience. Every actor was invested in these characters and making them uh, fully fleshed out, very human characters. And... Uh, I, uh, I recall when we were at that cottage, uh, as the sun was coming up, we, a few of us were still up and we looked out the window and there was seven white-tailed deer, or seven cast members. And the review that is the only one I actually ever remember was, <laughs> I can't remember which Toronto paper, but when, when this play opened, unexpectedly in the Poor Alex, which is a very dinky, doesn't exist anymore, it's a little dinky hole in the wall, it was, a, it was a space that David Mervish, the famous Mervishes who have uh, the Royal Alex Theater, this was his little playground he created for this kind of work. 
Magnificent Seven duel on sexual battlefield. Wow. Doesn't get any better than that. that and, is, that's the dream quote right there. Yeah. That, so it was an incredible ride. It was a just night after night. We were, we, they, we sold out. We were, people were lined up around the blocks. People in fur coats were showing up. Famous directors and people would want to come and see this play. We were this close to Broadway. <laughs> uh, no, I'm serious. Like Mervish was this close to cutting a deal and he couldn't, I don't know if I should say, because there was a. Say it. it, no, it it's just between us. Oh, okay. Well, he couldn't cut the deal with Brad's agent. They were offering 10% to the playwright, which is unheard of on Broadway. You'd get like 0.4%. And he didn't go. Hmm. But that's how, that's what they felt the quality of the show was. Mervish, who produces for the Royal Alex, wanted to take this play with these actors to Broadway. And we didn't get to go. So my life is full of the almosts. Yeah. Oh, you're, uh, you, you did those two episodes in the series. You're going to be back as a regular next year. Oh, <laughs> seriously, cancel. Right. That is the mercurial nature of this business, hey? Um, here is uh, the poster, I believe. Uh, is it coming up on screen for you there? I see it. Yeah. Uh, there is Mr. Shaw right there, marked for you. And uh, as Joe said, the late great Brent Carver here on Crow's Theater production. So, um, so talking about Brent Carver, uh, I, I only ever got to see him perform live, I believe just once in a production of High Life that was a Crow's Theater production that they had remounted, I think, after doing it many years previous. Um, and uh, I found him an incredible performer, but most of what I know of him, I've heard through other people, uh, and he's, he's legendary for being an incredible performer. So I think a question, and you probably get asked this a lot, and maybe this is an interesting place to talk about it, is... Um, what what made him such a great actor? What makes uh, you know an actor who who has whatever that something is? What is that other something? What did he have that uh, that that was so incredible? He has a, a a presence like the guy. You could be at a party where people are talking, and Brent could just start to sing a song, and the party <laughs> stops and turns and watches him. He could and get, or he could get everyone singing along. He just had that kind of power. He was both, he was, ex, he had extremely dynamic on stage, but he was also a very kind and um, a very vulnerable person, um, very uh, caring person. But he, he carried a lot of sadness as well as this kind of incredible light and joy. And he brought the full range of human emotion to what he, uh, whatever his performances were. And he was so spontaneous. I mean, one of the things I was, I think I told you before about the human remains is I, as Robert, I come to pick up his roommate candy for a date. And David, Brent Carver's David, opens the door. I never knew what I was going to get when he opened <laughs> that door. I had to work spontaneously off of whatever David arrived. Uh, sorry, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever uh, Dave, yeah, whatever David arrived at the door and, and let me in. And, and he taught me about being in the moment, about playing spontaneously, about that sense of kind of freedom and living it. Not phoning in uh, the same thing you did last night. Every night for that cast was fresh and alive. And they all came from Brent as, the, as that kind of engine that drove us in that way. And it made us all better actors. And it made that show take off in a way that uh, other productions of the show have not, maybe not achieved in the same way. Cause I don't think people take the play or the characters as seriously as we did. We really uh, sought to uh, find sympathetic journeys for each of those roles. And the, one of the conversations we had on, on Saturday with the cast was because it was, a, it was about love. It was about the search for love. It wasn't about being salacious or the, the sex or the nudity, even that was part of it, but it was the search for love that humanized all that. And I think as actors, we were able to dig deep and deeper because of him leading the way. Wow. And, and credit to Jim Milan, the director of Crow Theater uh, for many, many years, who created an open environment of trust where we could all risk and take chances and, um, and do our best work and without uh any kind of fear hmm. it was it was a fearless show <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible thank you uh 
All right, we'll pause here for a second before we go on to the next uh, next little uh, event or a period of Joe's, Joe's career here. Uh, and we have a winner from our, our last question, um, which is um, in when, uh, what was Company of Rogues named after? And I realized I should also give the answers in case you're not uh, reading along with this because uh, Company of Rogues was founded in 1993. That was the answer to the first question. And number two, Company of Rogues was named after Rogue beer, which was made by an Oregon brewery. What's, it, what's the mm -hmm. actual brewery called? It's, 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 it's oh, it Rogue. Rogue Beer. It's Rogue, Rogue Beer. Rogue Beer. Oh, yeah. Rogue Beer is the brewery, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a, it was bottled it. You can still get it. It's a, you can get it in the liquor store. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you will become a better actor if you have a bottle, I believe, is what I hear. Or two. Or two. Uh, and the winner of that was uh, Glenna McKenzie. Congratulations, Glenna. All right, which brings us to question number three, and uh, they're getting they're getting more difficult. We we threw you some some nice soft ones to begin with here, but this is going to be a little <laughs> more difficult. Which is, uh, who is the most produced playwright by Rogues Theater, which is the theater company that Company of Rogues uh, has has been running in tandem for for many many years? Um, who is the most produced playwright uh, in uh, by Rogues Theater, and also happens to be one of Joe's all-time favorites, maybe his all-time favorite, I don't know, um, but definitely one of the, the top favorites. And if you were listening carefully, he has already mentioned this playwright in this Q&A session. So who was the most produced, who is the most produced playwright of Rogue's Theater and also one of Joe's favorites? Put your questions into the comments. Interesting, okay. when I mentioned that playwright, that was my first introduction to that playwright was being in a particular show. Are you serious? Really? Mm -hmm. no way. Oh, there we go. Oh, let's see if you're listening carefully. Okay. So now uh, I'd love to go on and, and, and talk about uh, some of your experiences in film and TV. And uh, you have an epic resume of, of, of film and TV credits. So, I mean, there's so many places we could, we could go from, but there's a couple that kind of tie together that uh, seems to be uh, interesting to talk about. And that are uh, the two films, Crazy Canucks, which was uh, in 2004, and then Everest in uh, 2007. Uh, the first of which was, was directed by Randy Bradshaw, if I'm correct. And then the second was produced by, by Randy Bradshaw. Um, uh, so you had you know, a significant working relationship with him. Um, in the first one, Crazy Canucks, you played Colin Lund. So can you tell us who, what, tell us about this film, Crazy Canucks. I'm going to bring up some pictures here in a second while you chat. Um, and uh, who is, who is this Colin Lund? <laughs> well, first of all, Crazy Canucks, for those people who don't know, the Crazy Canucks were the Canadian downhill ski team back in the 1970s, 75, 76 seasons were the seasons that we covered. And, uh, they were called Crazy Canucks because of their kamikaze style, heading straight downhill. Uh, and they were the first group of Canadians to, to medal on platforms in, in the European, uh, you know, uh, European uh, competitions, the downhill ski competition. So this uh, film basically kind of chronicles the, those adventures. It was a, a TV movie for CTV. I played the only fictional character in the movie. The rest were all historical, but they, they, there was a different, I was the assistant coach. So there was a different coach between those two seasons and they didn't want to muddy up the story. They wanted to condense it. There he is. So I'll just, that's Colin Lund. I'll just tell you about the look. I, um, I actually created that look for this character based on my wrestling coach from high school, John, <laughs> John Drowan who uh, had that kind of stash. His might have been a little bit better than mine. Uh, you know, the Burton Cummings kind of full hair, the shades, all of that. It was, um, it was a very deliberate creation on my part to kind of, uh, you know, insinuate myself back into that time period with a very, what I felt a very uh, visceral uh, kind of image that I was drawing from. So that's Colin Lund right there. Interesting. And now, so you said, you had input on on what this this look is is that something that happens typically or you know or is and why was it so important to you what why, why did this physical image why was that so important to you um well what i would say is that over the years as i you know as i've uh you know you kind of develop your confidence as an actor to be able to kind of have a little bit more creative input 
in your work, both on stage and, and in film, I, I found that there was a little room, like I would, when I would go sometimes into uh, wardrobe fittings and whatnot, that sometimes the wardrobe person or the designer would go, what do you think? How are you feeling? How are you feeling as this character? Does this feel right for you? And they start to ask you these sorts of questions and sometimes hair and makeup people. So I, um, when this show came up, I just, the, the image just came to me. Yeah, that's me in the middle there. Uh, the image just, uh, uh, some of you might recognize it, Lucas Bryant there on the left from the TV series Heaven. He played Ken Reed, uh, the infamous Ken Reed. And that's uh, uh, Curtis Harrison, who is playing Steve Podborski, or Pod, as he was known back in the day. Um, but I don't know, this image came to me uh, so, so fully, I couldn't resist it. And I just started to grow the stash and the hair. And I, you know, and I, I talked with them about it well ahead of time because we, we knew quite in advance before we were going. I, I, I probably had six weeks or more, which is not usual. And I said, this is the look that I'm thinking. And they're like, yeah, we love it. So the, the only thing is I'm in um, Austria in what was it, 2004, walking around looking like I walked out of 76. And it's not like you can, you know, with the stash and everything, I'm sure people are like, who's this dude? Um, <laughs> But, uh, it, you know, going to Austria for five weeks to make a movie is, again, one of those other, it, you know, I, I, I mean, I've been pretty blessed. That's a, an adventure of a lifetime. Wow. Incredible. So, and and uh, the, the bonding, like it was about a team. And so we had to come together as a team, you know, from the two coaches and, and the five skiers. And uh, there was only two actors from Calgary. There was myself and some of you might know Brian Jensen who's uh, been in the theater community and film community here for, for many, many years. And uh, the other actors were from Toronto, Vancouver. And we had a couple of actors, you know, from uh, Germany and Austria with, you know, playing Franz Klammer, uh, you know, and some of the, uh, some of the uh, opposing skiers. So that was nice. pretty cool too. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then uh, next, so that was 2004, and then 2007, you played Peter Spear in uh, Everest, the miniseries Everest, and I'll bring up a little photo here from you on set. Ah, uh, yeah, that's me, uh, Kevin Krushkowitz, Krushkowitz, who was a, an actor here in Calgary uh, for many years, and then I think he's in Toronto now, went to Vancouver, maybe he's in Toronto now. Uh, he plays a character, Rusty, and I'm Peter Spears. Peter Spears was, is a real guy, so I got to play the real human being. Peter Spears was a high school principal and teacher in Calgary, but he leads people to base camps uh, on Everest. That's a big thing. I don't know if he still does. He would be quite a bit older now, but at, even at that time, he was still doing it. Um, and so I was, um, uh, you know, I created this character. I, it's funny. Uh, I wasn't sure why I was cast in this role because I look—I don't look anything like Peter Spears, who's quite tall and very kind of lean, and I'm kind of not. Um, but I, uh, on the uh, in the rap party, uh, Graham, the uh, director, is like, "Hey, Joe, you want to know why uh, I cast you as Peter Spears?" I go, "Yeah, I'd love to know." He goes, "Because I kept thinking about Peter Spears. What the, what I liked about Peter Spears was he's a nice guy." I thought. Joe's a nice guy. Joe's like Peter Spears. <laughs> Joe's Peter Spears. So it's interesting how we get cast in these things. But uh, yeah, so that was, that was another ad adventure with some awesome actors. Again, another kind of team-oriented uh, picture where you, know, you kind of all got to pull together. And I remember uh, shooting out on the Columbia ice fields as the sun was Mm. dying and it was freezing cold we were the first people ever allowed to shoot on the columbia ice fields really no way hmm. yeah and the actors are like come on come on boys we got to get this shot and everyone's just like digging in like because we're all we're freezing man but we got to get the shot and uh i don't know there's there's just that sense of camaraderie and that sense of collaboration that you, you all kind of uh go to go to battle together you know to, to get the shot to get to make a great film together and so, um, like Crazy Canucks, these, these kind of collaborative team shows, I've, I've done a couple of them. And, and not only that, is the Peter Spears is, a, is the base camp um, leader, is also very much like a coach. 
So I, I don't know, I've, I've tended to get a lot of coaching roles over the years, track coaches and others as well. So I'm not sure what that's about. <laughs> and you bring up a great point. I know people often ask, you know, like, when am I ready to be in a film or something? And I think, you know, just ask yourself, if I was in the middle of the Columbia ice field, surrounded by a film crew, losing the light, am I ready to give that performance? Uh, and I feel confident in that, then uh, maybe that's your, maybe that's your time. I don't know. <laughs> um, great. Okay. We will uh, take a pause there for a moment. Um, the winner of our previous question is Abigail Van Merlin. Congratulations, Yay. Abigail, for the answer to the question. The uh, most produced playwright by Rogue's Theater is John Patrick Shanley. And if you were listening closely, Joe talked about being in Women of Manhattan by John Patrick Shanley, which was, I, I didn't know this, his, his first introduction to, uh, to that writer who, who you've become you know, incredibly well-versed in his work over the years, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and our po the posters that you know littered the office uh, were, um, uh, were were full of pa Patrick Shanley plays. So great. Yeah, and the the first Rogues Theater production was Italian American Reconciliation by John Patrick Shanley, done again as a ten year anniversary. So we we did that one twice. What do you love about his his writing so much? It's fierce. Mm. It's intense. It's it's very New York. It's very it's very it's very passionate, and hysterically funny. It's very moving, but you you can't help but laugh at the same time. The characters are endearing, and and they're all struggling with life, and they they have big feelings and uh, and big hearts, cool. and and just the, and the the Bronx dialect, it's it's infectious. How can you not like it? <laughs> so true, so true. Um, okay, we're gonna do our uh, last trivia question. Uh, of the evening, which is, what was the last play Joe acted in? What was the last play that Joe acted in? That's been a while. Questions in the comments. Uh, I saw it, it was terrific. It was an excellent show. Um, that's not gonna help you in finding the answer, but uh, it's good information. Okay, so now, Joe, what I'd love to uh, jump over into are some questions about the craft about acting. And uh, thank you everyone out there for sending us your questions that you wanted to ask Joe. Um, part of the fun of this is to get to ask Joe some questions that maybe don't always come up in class. So we have so we have some questions here. You can choose, they can be rapid fire, quick answer questions, or you can talk about whatever you feel like. But uh, here we go. First question is from Glenna. If you could meet any actor or director from any time in history, who would it be and why? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a tough question. I mean, there's so many to, to, to choose from. Uh, hmm. I'm drawing a blank. I mean, there's a, there's the person I probably would have wanted to meet, I met, which was Paul Newman. Um, wow. Because he was married to Joanne Woodward and we were doing Sweetbird of Youth at, in Toronto. He came backstage and I, I didn't have a real full on conversation, but I got to say, hey, Paul, how's it going? Uh, uh, but I, I love the actors of, of kind of that era, you know, maybe, maybe Robert Redford. Yeah, so good. Because he, you know, he's a he's a fine actor, but also a great filmmaker, mm. and and just someone who's really dedicated themselves to the art form over the years. You know what? W once I go go away from this uh, an hour from now, I'm going to go. Oh, I should have said so and so. <laughs> People always ask me, "What are your favorite?" Well, I can't remember. Like oh, I don't know. I, have, I need a list in front of me to like. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, Lindsay asks. What is a common mistake that new actors make? Uh, I think the common mistake is, it's, it's interesting because I think that you alluded to it in your introduction, is that you have to be other than yourself. That you have to start working from yourself first and, and working from your inner emotional life, your full range of, possibilities that are, are uh, you know, from, from within yourself, because all of human experience 
is there within you to, to experience, to express. So your job is to tap into that, not become something else. You will become something else, but it'll be from within. And that therefore more authentically rendered because it, it comes from within and then expresses outward. So one of the most common mistakes I think is people, they, they wanna present something. They wanna be different from themselves. They, they wanna, I, I see this a lot, particularly with kids like out of high school. It's like, they wanna know how a line is said to make it be a certain way as opposed to discovering it organically within themselves. And so, and I, I, I will admit that I have developed this philosophy and way of working through the experience of, of uh, both as an actor, but directing actors and teaching actors and, and watching what gets the best out of them, which is um, giving them space to create and trust them and giving them just enough guidance to kind of find it within themselves. Great, wonderful. Um, next is from Chris. Have you ever looked back at a past performance and thought to yourself, I would play it differently if, it, if I was playing it now? Yeah, particularly the early film stuff that I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. Uh, I, I feel like I was pushing a little bit in those early days and it took me, a, you know what? I will, I will admit that I met um, a, a fine film actor uh, was married to her for 21 years. Her name was Christian Hurt. Uh, still one of my best friends in my family. And she taught me so much about film acting, what, not just watching her performances, but she started helping me with my auditions and my mm -hmm. approach to film changed. And so if I could go back and grab a f the first few of those roles and make them more internally uh, based and more truthful, I would love to be able to do that. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure there are other things along the road in my early theater days, but they're not captured on film. So uh, I can't tell you how good or bad they were. They may have been over the top or pushed, uh, but um, I, hopefully, I'm a different actor now. <laughs> well, no doubt you are. Yeah. Um, next question is from Jessica. In your opinion, what have been the most positive as well as negative changes in the industry over the span of your career so far? Hmm. Well, I think the most positive I think is happening now is I think it's opening up for lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds and, and uh, open, um, you know, with different cultures, different ethnicities, opening up for women. I, I just think that opportunities are opening up. It's not perfect. There's, you know, it's, it's still a tough game. Uh, and so I think that's a very positive. And I, and I also think in addition to that, the quality of acting has the potential to, because I think we, what we understand about the process can, can make for more authentic performances. Mm. The negative side I would say is that I think that not everyone respects the craft. As they, as people want to be famous. They just want to look good. They just want to um, be a part of something without actually doing the work. And uh, I, I don't know, you, you, some of you may have seen, I have posted a, a previously a video of Charles Nelson Riley from his one man show, the, the, the Life of Riley, where he talks about being in Uta Hagen's first acting class. If you've never seen that video, it, it is both hysterically funny but also quite touching because he, one of the things he says, people back then used to take class. They used to study, they used to train to be actors. And I think that uh, obviously I, you know, rogues, that's what we do because we really believe in it and you never stop learning. You know, a good actor stays humble and, and, and tries to learn with each role and, and, and develop their craft through that experience, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's on stage or in, in front of the camera, you, you, you can't, it doesn't, st the learning doesn't stop. There's always something new to learn. You know what, what's great sometimes in classes, I'll see a scene that I've uh, seen done, uh, that I've seen it done many times and all of a sudden somebody finds something completely different. I'm going, wow, wow, where did that come from? Something completely original, even though I might've seen this 25 times, hmm, so. That's incredible. Uh, Becky asks, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? A la James Lipton on Inside the Actors Studio. <laughs> what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? 
you were a good man. Awesome. Uh, next on to uh, Terry asks, when starting out, are there any types of roles you might find more beneficial than others? Also, are there any types you may want to be cautious of? Hmm. I would say the second part of the question is important, the most important because, um, oh, firstly, I don't think that actors always know how they're best cast, particularly when they're starting out. They may go, oh, why am I auditioning for this? I'm, I'm not like this at all. And then everyone else goes, oh, yes, you are. Um, <laughs> and so it, it, sometimes you need to kind of listen to other voices, just like picking your own headshots is not really a good idea. Mm. If you need some other outside opinions. I do think you've got to know what kind of actor you want to be. And if there are certain things you're not comfortable with, you know, if there's certain kinds of roles that you can't play, then I think you need to be honest about it and don't go and audition for that role. I mean, I, to be honest, and I know I've shared this in class before, I don't want to be in a slasher film. I don't want to play a, a rapist or, a, you know, a child molester or anything like that. I don't want to put, I, I mean, I know there are actors that will take those parts. I just, I don't want to go there as an actor. And I don't really want to put that image out as it's, it's a world that I don't want to visit. So I would, I would just say, thank you for the uh, offer of the audition, but no, thank you. I'm not interested in playing that. Um, uh, other than that, I think that most roles are going to stretch you uh, sh short of feeling that negative about something. Most roles, um, I think if you embrace them, uh, you can you can take any role and find something great in it. You you want to find the humanity. You want to um, take that character's journey seriously and really find the humanity. Like I was talking about human remains earlier. Like I, I have talked to other actors who have worked on productions about play, and one of the things someone said I won't mention about the role I play was, "Oh, it's a thankless part." I go, "What do you mean it's a thankless part? This is this this." lost soul searching for love and you know he's trying to connect with this woman and you know and we and it's like well, you know. um but you you know i think that no matter how small the role is no matter how um even if it's not that well written you can bring your artistry your humanity to the role mm -hmm. and and make it be the best it can and then you're you're serving um let's say a, a new playwright or a new screenwriter uh to, to help them see their work in its best light. So, um, yeah. Cool. Uh, Jordan asks, do you believe some people are born with the acting talent or does someone have to be taught and certified to be taken seriously in the industry? I mean, I, there, I, there are certainly people who have a natural ability that, that it comes more quickly to them. I mean, what you learn uh, through classwork training is you you're giving technique to your natural ability you're giving it structure just like a hockey player has to learn how to skate before they can pick up a hockey stick and even address the game of hockey an actor um, may have an innate sense of you know bringing different uh, situations and, and uh, emotional range to life through themselves but I, I find that without the training there, there isn't a consistency. Mm. Uh, it's, it becomes hit or miss because they're not, they don't know how they got there. They're relying on inspiration, but the inspiration doesn't have a structure or a technique. And I think that you can, you, an actor needs to have both. You need to have structure, you need to have technique, but within that framework, you need to be able to work spontaneously and intuitively and inspirationally. Uh, so it is a comb, you know, like, uh, a, a guitarist or any musician has to learn to play the scales. They learn to practice the scales, practice the scales, practice the scales, and then they learn to play songs and then they master their work and then they can go out and improvise. Or right, same with painters sometimes, you know, looking at the master, studying the masters and then developing your own from there. I think <laughs> actors need to have something of that. I, um, I think it's rare the actor who can uh, give us a, a full, a fully ranged uh, career because maybe one performance they can be great, but the next performance because they, they don't know how they got it, they don't yeah. know how they got there, they don't have a way of working, uh, and so to ensure that kind of consistency, uh, having an approach 
uh, which, which can be flexible, which can be fluid with different projects and with theater and film and the, the, the kind of demands of the role. But I think that you, you need to develop a methodology and a way of working to develop that kind of consistency. That's just my thought. Yeah, too, too right. Uh, last audience question. Uh, I kind of combined two here because they had touched on a similar topic and this is from Cesar and Laysan. Uh, and they ask, uh, what are your expectations for acting and opportunities in Alberta because of COVID? And what have you discovered about the actors and artists purpose during these difficult times? Well, those are really hard questions because to be yeah. honest, uh, I feel like we are in such uncertain times um, our hope is that we can start to shoot. I know that theater wise, we're, we're limited to the, you know, you can't put a big audience out there on to perform. So theater actors are kind of hooped right now until, until health protocols change and we're allowed to be uh, more, you know, larger groups in a, in a room. So I, I am cautious about it. I, I, you know, it, it seems like there are some productions that are preparing to go ahead here as well as in Vancouver that are trying to put uh, appropriate health protocols in place to, to, to address the COVID thing. Um, uh, and I think that we will slowly try to creep into it and see whether we can produce things un, under those conditions. And if it's, you know, financially viable to, you know, because it's going to, it's going to probably take more time uh, to, to shoot in, in that manner. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, these are, these are strange times. And I, I think that, um, although in saying all that, I think that we have to hold out the hope that we are moving forward in some sort of positive ways, even though we don't know what it is right now. We have to kind of embrace a sense of um, maybe this is some sort of world correction that we need to undergo. I, I can just say from my own personal experiences, what I've felt is a slowing down, uh, taking time and really uh, investing in the moment because I don't know uh, all the answers to what's going to happen down the road. And so, trying to connect with family, to enjoy a beautiful night. And just by this, this is, this is what is right now. And if I'm on set eventually or on stage eventually again, which I, I believe we will, um, but uh, I don't know that how, how fast that's going to happen. I think the film is coming more quickly than theater just because of the nature of the way it's produced. Uh, so, I encourage you to hold out hope, keep your dreams alive, uh, keep working on your craft, whether it's in class or whether it's on your own in whatever capacities you can or putting out self tapes and whatnot, you know, don't, don't lose sight of it because I think that, you know, we all have to, if, if we buy into fear, or if we buy into negativity, then we're not making the world a better place. I think we're making a world a better place when, when we can bring some positive, loving, passionate energy to what we do and to, and to uh, the sharing with each other in our collaboration and, and, you know, in time, things are going to, I don't want to say uh, return because it's going to, it's probably going to be something that seems like a going back. And I think it's a, a, a forward movement so, to someplace new, but good, a good kind of new. Good kind of new. Yeah, it's a, that's a great place uh, for us to, uh, to, uh, to end our audience uh, questions. Thank you everybody for submitting your questions. And if we didn't get to, I'm sorry we couldn't get to every question, uh, but maybe we'll do a sequel down the road. Let us know in the comments if we should do something like this again or in some slightly different form, who knows. Um, so uh, uh, to return, our last trivia question is, is actually uh, um, controversial here. Uh, I didn't realize this, but uh, when we when we were coming up with these trivia questions, uh, Joe, I think I think you will be uh, surprised to find out that uh, we were actually <laughs> wrong about what the answer was. Um, so the end. The question was, what was the last play that Joe performed in? Um, and uh, uh, Jordan Gooden answered Twelve Angry Men," which I believe to be correct, and Joe believed to be correct, and Sally believed to be correct. But Adina Warren mentions that technically. 
Joe did do a voice in the uh, Company of Rogues performance intensive production of Midsummer Night's Dream playing Hippolytus. Uh, and so we did technically hear his voice <laughs> on today. So uh, uh, Adina, sharp. And uh, we we will we will sort out some sort of bonus for you because that was uh, that's some that's some good sleuthing. So oh my you. god, the fact that you would even think of that, I <laughs> I, did, I didn't remember, and it was my idea. So oh my gosh. Anyway, yeah, there you go. Um, okay, all right. Well, gosh, that time uh, flew by, and I have a zillion other questions that I I wanted to ask Joe and. Uh, you know, and in, in some other session, hopefully we'll get to touch on such shows as Angela Too Good and Jack. Oh, my God. Uh, chief helper. Um, but uh, <laughs> you, can, you might have to ask him about that one over a, a beer until we can formally organize uh, another one of these. But uh, that is uh, a wonderful story, too. So we'll hopefully get to get to that in the future. Um, so uh, I want to say uh, some thank yous for tonight. Uh, to uh, for sending our questions. Also, thank you very much to uh, Veronica Ronsley and Abigail Van Merlin at CAD YYC, who we're going to be talking to uh, talking about in a minute. Sorry, uh, and Sally Chachik for uh, for so much of the organizational and technical work on making this happen. Um, uh, we do have to announce uh, uh, our winner for the um, for the scholarship, the four hundred dollar Rogues scholarship. A randomly chosen person who submitted a question. Uh, as well as uh, attending this live, uh, Sally, up in the up in the up in the ether, the cyber world. Do we, do we have a winner uh, of the four hundred dollar Rogues scholarship? Oh, uh, we can't see who's here live, so they will have to comment if you're here. So please uh, throw in a comment saying I'm here, uh, and we will choose somebody randomly from that. So if you are here watching this and you submitted a question, uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. All right. Our 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 rand our randomly uh, chosen person here. I guess we were able to. Uh, is oh hold on. We pull it. it Jessica. We're finding out if Jessica Lutzak is here. Jessica, if you are watching this, throw something into the chat. If you are watching this live, then uh, you are the winner of the four hundred dollar scholarship. Jessica Lutzak. We'll wait for confirmation from that here in a moment. Um, waiting, waiting. Is she here? Uh, no comment yet. Suspense. Filler, filler. Okay. So, um, she's we'll, here. Oh, she's here. She's here. Okay, great. Congratulations. Hey. Jessica. You won a $400 scholarship. Thank you for being here. Thank you for submitting a question and uh, we'll be in touch about that. Now, um, uh, as, as Joe mentioned uh, at the end of the questions there, a good new place. Um, and I think that's a great way to, uh, to segue into, uh, Joe, do you want to tell us a little bit about where is Rogues going now? We are into another, we are into our own good new place here. So uh, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I mean, as you all know, uh, we unfortunately lost our Calgary space back in April due to the whole COVID situation. Um, and we were able to finish our spring term online. Uh, Sally and Aaron and I and a, f and a few others, we, we continued on and we and taught some classes on the, over the summer online as well, which has been very successful, I think, in terms of how the, the courses went. I, I felt particularly the film classes, but not even the scene study classes, like the online classes were, um, uh, there was awesome work and I felt people learn and, and, and grew in a, an incredible rate under those circumstances. Um, in the meantime, we have uh, secured a, a new space called uh, the Center for Artistic Development with our good friend, uh, Abigail Merlin, whom some of you may know, and uh, Rebecca Rosley, who's her creative partner. And um, some of you have rehearsed in that space. I know it's been renovated and some things have been uh, evolving there over time, uh, but they have generously uh, offered us a space to begin to teach classes there in September, um, which gives us a, a, a new place to start, a new beginning, September the 14th. So we are really excited about our, uh, our shared arrangement with them and our, uh, our creative partnership with them and be able to bring a pretty much a, it'll, it'll be a slightly smaller menu of classes, but it'll be mostly the, the main course is focusing on the acting, of, uh, which is obviously what we're all about. We are able to put out together a masterclass program for, for new first years. We are able to uh, finish 
the second year for those who were with us last year for masterclass. And there'll be room for sessional students as well as we uh, put together this 2020-21 set of classes. Now, of course, we don't know what the state of the world is going to be over time. So the COVID thing and health protocols and whatnot, we will be following to the best of our ability, whatever we're required to do in terms of health protocols within the classroom, uh, you know, masks and uh, uh, keeping the place sterilized and whatnot. Um, but uh, so our intention is to keep everyone healthy uh, and, but also to proceed with classes in person if that is possible. And we're fairly hopeful that, that that's going to be, uh, be, we're gonna be able to do that. Now, the flip side is, is if anything happens, we are prepared. We are ready to go online again. So one way or the other, rogues will continue to, uh, to, to su support your work, to, to work with you, to train you, to keep this community alive that we, we've had here for the last 26 years. And so we invite you back to the studio, be it at the uh, Center for, for Artistic Development. Hopefully, yes, please. Uh, if it's online, on Zoom, like we are here. But one way or the other, we are forging ahead with a, a positive attitude and a passion for, uh, for this art form and for serving you and continue to work together, collaborate, and keep this community spirit alive. So um, the new space is down in Chinatown. And so it's a new location for us. We're going to have to find, uh, there's no Jamesons in the neighborhood. So <laughs> we're going to see if they've got some cold Sapporo or something on tap around there. Uh, some Sing Pal would be nice. And, uh, and, and have a, a place to congregate if we're, if we're allowed. <laughs> Six feet apart, but yeah. masks. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so we're, we're excited about the fall. And so um, we are full, full steam ahead one way or the other. So that's kind of what's happening with us. And we're, uh, we've got uh, a wonderful new beginning, September the 14th. Great. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had some sort of virtual video teaser that we could show of the new space? Sally, mm. do you have that ready to roll? Can we hit it? I do, fun. she does. A, a, a virtual, through, I'm excited to see this. Through the magic of technology, we are going to take you inside momentarily. While we're waiting, I'll say that I'm, I'm teaching a full semester of drama at St. Mary's University all online because the universities are not coming back yet, hopefully in January, but that will be interesting. Yeah. No, I know it's it, it, it's a crazy thing, as, as you said, like, uh, I mean, who knew that we'd all be teaching online? And But who knew that it would work so well? I mean, I, I will admit to, you know, <laughs> to being skeptical of going like, can we actually make this work? And, and, and it, it does. I mean, it's, it's not the same as what the other thing is, but it, it's, it, it can work and, you know, you can learn and there are, there are some interesting even advantages in it too. So, um, yeah. That's I like cool. the intimacy, like even right now, I, yeah. you know, you're, you're very close. I can see there's a nice intimacy there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that once we hopefully get back into this, this beautiful new space. Okay. Oh, she's ready. All right. Here we're going to have a, a look eh, at the, at our beautiful new space that we're going to be working out of. All right, hit it. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Awesome. That was a little peek into the new studio space. Wow, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody uh, for coming out tonight for this, uh, this, this first experiment. Thank you for your, again for your questions and for being here. And uh, let us know if you want more of these, do you want us to do something else like this? Do you want us to do some kind of different thing where, you know, we're in a world where all these new things are, are open and uh, uh, possible and, and, and we're interested in doing them. So, so let us know what you think. Um, and I want to say, of course, a, a huge thank you to Joe for, for uh, giving us your time and, uh, and sharing uh, these wonderful stories and this incredible wisdom, uh, as well as obviously your ongoing support of new actors uh, you've been doing it for for 25 years and still going strong 25 plus years and still going strong and uh um just as you were talking about your evolution as an actor you you you're only getting to be a better and better teacher all the time and uh and you're constantly full of incredible nuggets of wisdom so thank you very uh, much for yeah. sharing some of that with us tonight i got a million of them <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fun it was fun thank you aaron i really appreciate uh yeah. you're leading the way here and then sally for uh, getting this technologically uh, lined up, including the little video we just watched. That was great. So I, I thank you guys for everything that you put into this studio because it's, uh, we're, we're, we're the fall. We are there uh, to work with the students in the fall. And, and thanks to, to Abigail and Rebecca as well. We're looking forward to that journey ahead. And for all of you out there in TV land, uh, th thank you for being here tonight. It's great to, I didn't, couldn't see you, but hopefully, uh, Feel your presence and you know we're so excited to see you in person soon and keep this vision going so love to everybody thank you so much thank you good night